welcome back to another episode of Beyond the To-Do List. I am your host, Eric Fisher, and this is the show where we talk to the people behind the productivity. Don't forget to head over to readyaimfirebook.com to grab my book about making and achieving goals. No matter what format of the book you pick, you get the audiobook version for free, read by me. Again, go to readyaimfirebook.com to pick that up. This week, I'm talking about delegating and virtual freedom with Chris Ducker. Chris and I talk about training and delegating and managing a team, virtual or otherwise, how delegation can prevent you from having burnout, how you can focus on task or project-based outsourcing or team-building outsourcing. And honestly, one of the biggest things, one of the biggest takeaways from this podcast and all the episodes is contained in this episode. It's Chris's three lists. So listen in and pay close attention for that one. But before we get to that conversation, I want to let you know that this episode is brought to you by Rike. That's W-R-I-K-E. Rike is a stress-free task management system where you can centralize your tasks and files, your ideas, your projects and plans. You can collaborate on tasks and documents in real time. It saves you time by collecting all the status updates and keeping your team on the same page. Visualizes your work reports automatically and allows you to work from wherever you are with mobile apps. Imagine if tasks become overdue, an urgent document is lost, or an important note is misplaced. It can be distressing, but it doesn't have to be a real disaster if, say, before a conference or a product launch, you have everything in place inside Rike. Because Rike connects all your tasks and projects and plans and files and discussions in one platform, your colleagues and you will always have your to-dos up to date so you can get things done together. Beyond the to-do list listeners can get a special offer from Rike. Just go to Rike dot com slash to do to start a free 30 day premium subscription and see how collaboration can be easy and fun using Reich. This week, I get to talk to Chris Ducker. Chris, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, sir, Eric. It is an honor and a privilege. And I was going to say and a gentleman, but that does not make sense. I think I'm thinking of the whole English thing. You anyway. are. I'm, I'm messing you up already with my accent. Aren't right. I? Yeah, a <laughs> little bit. I, 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 I have this weird thing where I start to adopt an accent of others that are around me because I pretty much just have a flat, un-American, bland accent from America, you know, so – well, that's why I like to go and hang out in New York so much because in my past life, I'm almost 100 percent sure that I was a mob boss in some capacity. <laughs> I, I could see just, that. Yeah, just the way they talk and act. Hey, how you doing? You know, that's, I, I love it. I love hanging out in New York. It's great. <laughs> has, has anybody ever told you you look a little like Jeremy Statham? Yeah, a couple people. From the Italian job and a couple other things. Yeah. I can't remember what, what else. Actually, I, I, I grew up around the same area that he did in London. So, oh, nice. Uh, yeah, we've got a little bit in common. Wish I had his bank account. Don't have that in common. I know, right? <laughs> <But there you go. laughs> On the way, though. So, oh, yeah. so you grew up in London. I did. I That's did indeed. Awesome. London, England. And uh, yeah, it's fond, fond memories of London. I haven't lived there since um, 2000. I moved here to the Philippines in the year 2000, middle of the 2000. And uh, yeah, but I, so, you know, I get back to England once a year at least, sometimes twice, uh, you know, it, particularly if they're speaking engagements or I end up doing, you know, mastermind gigs over there or something along those lines. But, uh, yeah, it's, um, it's great. I love London. It's just, you know, I don't like the gray wet weather. Mm -hmm. So I live in the tropics instead. <laughs> right now we're getting slammed by snow in the Middle East. And I know I keep hearing from everyone. It's terrible. I hope you guys warm up soon. Yeah, I think it will be. We're, it's funny because I grew up in New York, state of New York, and, uh, we'd get, three feet of snow and still go to school here it's like half an inch and it's like oh no think, think of the children i don't get it right <laughs> <laughs> so so how did you how'd you get started with your business like what's your career path been like up to this point yeah i mean i i'm ultimately just a sales and marketing guy i you know i don't you know sort of put any kind of sugar coating on top of what i do and what i'm all about i'm a sales and marketing guy and uh, I dropped out of college uh, halfway through my degree to um, work full time for a publishing company in England. I was a classified sales guy, so it was my job to basically call up uh, companies for B two B publications and sell them 
ad space and magazines and other kind of yearly publications and things like that. And I worked with that company for seven years, um, became, you know, went through the ranks, became sales manager, sales director. By the time I left, I was managing guys twice my age, literally. And um, I uh, then sort of uh, did some consulting work for a while, sales training work for a while before coming over here to the Philippines. And I was working for some of the international banks here, training their telemarketers um, and uh, sort of just getting the whole kind of customer service stuff uh, sort of focused and, and dialed down here within the local uh, business world. Uh, and that was really – that was where the whole kind of outsourcing call center sort of type of journey began um, probably around 10 uh, – maybe – no, a little bit more, maybe almost tw- 12 years ago now. I sort of got involved in my first call center and outsourcing job and uh, yeah, here we are now. Um, the Lift to Sell Group, which is the the group of companies I own, uh, we've been going for eight years. We are um, at, I believe, around 270 employees now. We're rock and roll, and we, 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 there's three subsidiaries: as the call center, the Lift to Sell call center. Then we have Virtual Star Finder, which is the VA recruiting firm. That's what most people know me for online. And then uh, I also own uh, a co-working space here as well which is the first in 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 the entire city so it's uh it's kind of cool man you know it's, it's it's a cool place to do business and um you know the talent of the filipino workers and the the hard work kind of uh mentality and attitude that they have uh, i wouldn't be where i am now as an entrepreneur if i uh if i hadn't have um set up shop over here i'm pretty sure of that that's awesome. How, what uh, I kind of have a love hate relationship with that word entrepreneur because I don't. Mm-hmm. I think a lot of people have a lot of different definitions for that word. Um, sure. I assume you have your own definition. What was that definition, and and what made you move out from under the the publishing company out onto your own? I guess I mean by the time I'd left that company, I was actually already publishing my own magazine. Uh, which was aimed towards Hong Kong film fans. I was a big Hong Kong movie buff nice. back in the 90s, yeah. And um, it just felt natural to me. I kind of felt like I had um, I'd outgrown the, 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 the employee mindset. Um, and then I went over, like I said, I came over here and consulted for these large banks and, and uh, accredited agencies of the banks. And then I actually went back into, I, I, I missed out about a year there. I went back into the employee role for a company that was based over in Florida, an infomercial company. And, um, such a, not such a lovely guy to work for. Uh, but just the worst micromanaging pain in the butt that I've ever come across <laughs> in my life. I mean, he would, he would literally, I mean, I kid you not, he made me BCC him into every single email that I sent. Oh, that's a nightmare. Yeah, that was how bad it was. And I was making such good bank that I just couldn't walk away from it. I just got married. My wife had just uh, uh, rather married again. I'd been married twice. So um, I just got married for the second time, my wife. Uh, she was expecting our first, my third. I just couldn't walk away from the money, plain and simple. So yeah. I stuck with it for as long as I could for as long as I possibly could. And then it all came to a kind of rumbling mess of an end. Uh, when I was over in um, Miami for a month with the guy, we, we were shooting a couple of shows. We were working on retail branding, packaging together and all this sort of stuff. And everything was great. And by the end of the, by the end of the trip, he would just, he'd worn me down so much um, from a business standpoint that on my way home at 37,000 feet, Back home to the Philippines, I wrote resignation letter. I landed in Hong Kong, connected to their incredible free airport Wi-Fi, and hit the send button, and I've never looked back. Had to get out. Yeah, I just had to get out. And he wasn't happy about it, but it it is what it is. Uh, It was what it was. And, um, yeah, there's no way I'd be in the position where I am now if I hadn't made that decision to sort of quit that rat race once and for all and really go out and do my thing. And I mean, to, to, to comment on your, uh, you know, your comment about the whole kind of entrepreneur word, my role, I believe, as an entrepreneur is just very simply to provide answers to questions and solutions to problems. That's what I do. Oh, that's, that's, I do that's a, that is probably the best definition I've heard of that ever. <laughs> I love that. You I get love credit. You saying that. I, I'm going to probably tweet that later and credit you for that. That's awesome. I love that. I mean, you know like a gazillion people, right? So that's great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you've obviously done well for yourself. I mean, like you said, that was just – that was like uh, 
if I had to guess, that was like what, 2002, three something in there, four? Uh, yeah, I mean, it all kicked off sort of 2004-ish. And then, you know, the the real kind of defining moment for me, though, from the entrepreneurial mindset standpoint was late 2009. And what had happened was I had burnt out, ultimately. I was working my butt off building this business. Uh, at that point, we had about 130, 140 people working for us. I was doing 16-hour days, seven days a week, uh, almost seven days a week. And um, spending very little time with my family, you know, wasn't working out, wasn't looking after my diet. I was just, I was a mess. And yeah. I burned out, hit a, hit a wall right in the middle of November, uh, December. And so my wife went away in between Christmas and New Year. We went away, uh, myself and my wife, for a few uh, days, just a staycation locally here. We went down to one of the resorts. And, um, you know, we really, we, we talked, we just talked for hours and hours and hours and hours. Um, Long Island iced teas help that. Uh, so I'm just a little side note right there. But we talked for hours and hours and hours about it, uh, this whole situation of me burning out and, you know, really just being in every single tiny little aspect of the business. And I'd realized at that point that I was no longer running a business. The business was running me. And it was like you talk about a light bulb moment. It just hit me around the head like a wet fish. And I just said to myself, I've got to change something right now. And in the second week of January, I launched my first ever blog. Bearing in mind, up until this point, I'd never listened to a podcast. I'd never tweeted. I'd never written a blog post, right? So I started a blog January 20th or whatever it was that I launched it in 2010. And I told the world that by the end of that year, I was going to remove myself from my business day to day as much as possible and become a full-time virtual CEO. And what I did every month is I broke that that journey down month by month into these little reports that I would do. And in between the reports, uh, you know, I'd, I'd blog on a certain marketing, you know, thing that I was working on or how I was working with my virtual assistants. Cause I, I had a team of VAs working even prior to that, mostly sort of, um, uh, you know, project based or task based, but then sort of as things progress throughout the course of the year, I started hiring more and more virtual staff. I started talking about more and more. And by the end of the year, not only had become, the virtual CEO that I wanted to a month early, I might add in November, but I had developed this somewhat solid following on social media and on my blog, about 5,000 RSS subscribers and people were, were enjoying the journey. And I was starting to be seen as this guy who was really a go-to source for everything and anything virtual team related. And, um, er everything's just sort of grown from there, but that was the, the defining moment of saying enough, is enough. I've got to change this. And I'm very, very happy and proud to say today, four years later, I do a four day work week, not a four hour, unfortunately, <laughs> Mr. Ferris, Mr. Ferris, if you're listening in. Um, but uh, I do a four day work week. I don't work Fridays and I have a three day weekend and I absolutely love that. I have a couple yeah. of thoughts. One, I love the fact that you and your wife got away and that it was you and her kind of debriefing about the burnout. Like, as if you were both heads of the company, you know what I mean? Right, right. Because it's your, well, you know, your shared life and everything. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, to, if, if I'm to be very, very honest, and, you know, you put all the masculinity to one side and the ego and all that. Quite frankly, I believe that behind every really, really successful guy, there's an unbelievable woman or at least an unbelievable partner. Let's be politically correct here. You know what I mean? Like you need to have someone to go home to at night and share the trials and the tribulations and the struggles that you've been through and the wins mm -hmm. that you've been through in that day as well. Um, and my wife, uh, Erz is her name. She's just, she's a rock in every single sense of the word. And, uh, I wouldn't be able to, I wouldn't be able to do everything that I do today if it wasn't for her love and support. So, um, yeah, you're absolutely right. Yeah. It, we definitely it was, can't do it alone. No, you can't. You, you, yeah. you can't. I mean, you might be able to fake it for a little while uh -huh. and, and get to a certain point on your own. But sooner or later, you're, you're going to go mad. <laughs> <laughs> you're just going to go stir crazy, you know? Yeah. Well, and then also on the flip side of not doing it alone is this whole thing of, you know, people who are out there right now and they're like, 
I am my own personal brand. I'm my own personal solo entrepreneur thing. I do a I I answer questions and I what was you, you said solutions to to problems provide solutions right. yeah and they're that one single person in their thing. I mean, heck, that's me. At this point in time, that's me. I do that. Right. That's I don't have a VA. I don't have anybody else but me who records the shows, who posts the shows, who works on the writing of the books and the stuff and mm-hmm. and all that. I mean, I have some friends who you know help me, and we collaborate along the way. Otherwise, and again, so there's the proof right there. Like even even I can't do what I'm doing on my own. But how did you become aware of this whole idea of the virtual assistant? Because that's what it, I don't think we've mentioned that yet. A VA is a virtual assistant, not a veterinary assistant, like I originally <laughs> thought. Yeah. It's not about animals at all. It's <laughs> it's digital. Yeah, I... it's, Hire a team of vets to come and help <laughs> yes. you build your business. That's what it is. <laughs> you know, for some people that would make sense, but that's not the business we're in. <laughs> Depending on what the business is. Right. right. No, I mean, you know, uh, I get asked that question quite a bit. Like, you know, what is a VA? What can they do? What are they all about? And I mean, you know, outsourcing is not a new thing. Like, I want to clarify the four hour work week, Tim Ferriss did not invent outsourcing. A lot of people think that he did. Like, oh, because of. Tim Ferriss and the Four Hour Work Week VAs. No, VAs have been around for a long, 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 long time. Outsourcing has been around for decades. Companies have been outsourcing their IT, their accounts, their uh, you know their 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 um, bookkeeping, their uh, you know the, the HR. There's a ton of different things that you know companies have been outsourcing for a long, 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 long time. But what happened with the Four Hour Work Week? And with that book, the, the way that it just blew up the way that it did, um, it brought it to the mainstream, the entrepreneurial lifestyle design slash mainstream. Right. And um, it did an incredible thing. Like, you know, the, the websites like, you know, Odesk, Elance, Freelancer, these sites have been around for a long, long time before the 4-Hour Work Week came out. Long, long time. But because of that book, it just catapulted everything. So, you know... In short, a virtual assistant is somebody that you will work with to help you in some capacity run support and grow your business. And there's basically two different types of outsourcing in my eyes anyway. The first one is task or project-based outsourcing. So as an example, let's say you need a logo designed or a landing page developed or a video transcribed. That's a task that you will outsource. You'll pay for that one task to be done and once it's done it's done you move on then you've got project-based outsourcing which i kind of put in the same i put in the same kind of uh, pot here right as the task because with a project it is a one-time thing it, it, it might be a three-month project or a six-month project but once it's done it's done and everybody moves on so that could be you know like a bigger e-commerce site sort of type of deal um it could be uh, you know putting in place a digital marketing strategy or something along those lines um, and they're really, you know, that that kind of goes into the task and the and, and the project based outsourcing, uh, you know, sort of capacity. And then the one that I'm a big advocate of is the team building side of uh, VAs and outsourcing, which is when you are physically hiring people to work for you either on a part time or a full time basis, at so twenty or forty hours a week. You're injecting them into your business in a role, and that is the big big kahuna right there in regards to this second type of outsourcing it's not a task it's not a project it's a role that you're filling in so you hire for the role not for the task at this point and uh you know that's one of the biggest misconceptions a lot of people have when it comes to outsourcing they can hire one person and they'll be able to do everything for them like and i mean literally everything like you know edit videos upload podcasts write show notes Manage social media, manage your calendar, uh, you know, answer the phone, like just a re- SEO, web development, the whole kit and caboodle. It doesn't work. That's what you call a super VA, and it's a myth. They don't exist. So you've got to hire for the role, not for the task. And that's what outsourcing really is. Yeah, I was going to say, and another thing is, is it's almost like you're, you're building a team as small or as large as you need scale wise, but another word to use would be delegate even. Yeah, perfect. I mean, that's a, you know, that's if you want to use a more old-fashioned, more widely accepted and known word for this entire thing, then delegation would be it. 
for sure. Yeah. Absolutely. One of the uh, – that you just hit on it was this, this whole myth of a, a super VA was one of the things that I was thinking of. Like when people talk about that, I'm like, yeah, but am I supposed to like just think of all the different things that either – I don't have the time to do or don't know how to do or for that matter don't want to do and just pass them on to somebody else and then have them run all the stuff, you know, then what am I left to do? Yeah. And I mean it, it's one of those things like a lot of people also think that, um, you know, outsourcing in general is like, like once they understand what it's really about and how it works, they believe then <laughs> they, they get themselves all screwed up because they believe it's a magic pill that you can pop. And everything's going to work perfectly right out of the gate. And I mean, even if your VAs have the skill sets that you need for that role or that task or that project, even if they've got the skill sets, even if they've got the experience, even if they've got the great attitude that you really want every one of your employees to have, whether they be contractual or part of the full-time team, even if they've got all those things, they don't know how you want stuff done, Mm. how you like stuff done. You know what I mean? Yeah. And you know, this is one of the biggest mistakes that people, when they get involved with outsourcing and, and producing the, a team of VAs to become more productive, quite frankly, you know, one, one of the biggest mistakes is the assumption that they're going to know how to do everything your way right out of the gate. And it doesn't work like that. Um, and I mean, the perfect example is uh, about three or four years ago, I was with, working with a client. And um, he emailed me this, uh, you know, rampant email talking about how his VA, he was going to fire his VA, that uh, he, he, he gave her a task and it was terrible. And he asked his VA, quite frankly, to put together a list of Hannah Montana products to, uh, that could be potential gifts for his teenage uh, daughter. Um, and, you know, the VA put it together and, and, you know, sent it back and there was a list of the products. There was a price. For that particular product, there was about ten products or so, and then because it was Hannah Montana related, she thought it might be kind of fun to put sort of pink and purple and a few little boxes and a little Hannah Montana logo and all this sort of stuff on there, right? So the VA was using a little bit of initiative to put all that stuff together. Sends it through. First thing he says, well, why are you using pink and purple? Why aren't you using blue and red? They're, the, they're they're what I want on all of my documents. And why are you using Arial size ten? Why not Times Roman size twelve? That's what I like. <laughs> And why don't you have links to all these products on Amazon as well? Like I can't even see, you know, and I just turned around and said to him, well, did you tell her to do all those things? Uh. And he said, well, no, I just assumed that she would do it. Ah, so you made an assumption. There you go. Yeah. So, you know, that's like one of the biggest mistakes that people make is that everything's going to work perfectly right out of the gate. And you do have to spend a little bit of time with your VAs and particularly in the infancy stage of things and, you know, work with them closely. Let them know what you like. Yeah. Well, I mean, and that's one of those things. It's, it's regardless of, I mean, what you're talking about are principles that are just true, regardless of if you are connecting with an assistant virtually through tools or technology, or if they're in an office space with you. Right. It right. still applies. It, yeah. Exactly. Absolutely. And it, it's common courtesy. Yeah. At the end of the day, I mean, if you hire somebody, you, you've got to train them. You've got to tell them how you like things done. Oh, it's, the the it's expectation. Just a yeah. Principle. Right. Oh. It is. It's one of those things, and it's 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 something that you know it's it's getting better slowly. I've noticed with our with our clients at Virtual Star Finder, with the people that I have showed the book to already to sort of just have a little bit of a, a you know a bit of feedback from them and stuff like that. Like they're getting it, they're accepting it, they get it now. Uh, it is getting better, but it's a very slow moving kind of mindset shift for sure. So maybe going back a little bit further to the beginning, uh, obviously you've seen a real need for not only in your life but also for others and and hence uh, have written the book, which I guess we've not even talked about yet. Let me drop the name here. <laughs> the, the, book is, the book is called Virtual Freedom, How to Work with Virtual Staff to Buy More Time, Become More Productive and Build Your Dream Business. A lot of people are like, well, but why would I need to do that? And again, I go back to the you know person like me who is a solo person right now and gradually wants to grow. You've gone through that, and so again, what is it? What's that impetus? What's that turning point that you suddenly realize? Oh, one, I need help, and two, I can go to a virtual staff to get it. You know, some people are not going to go the virtual route. They're just not comfortable with it for 
whatever reason. Um, I believe it, it's not a matter of working with people in a specific country or in a specific salary range or you know in a specific town or, or, or whatever. We, we live in we live in a world now where everything everybody's connected, mm-hmm. right? And if you're not utilizing the talent that is out there from a global standpoint, you're just dumb. Like, honestly, like, I don't get that. Because, I mean, every website that I've had designed and built and developed in the last three, uh, four years even, has been by somebody that doesn't even live in the same country as me. Like, literally. So, you know, I I don't understand. Like, if I can do it, then anyone can do it. Um, And there's a couple of things that, that, you know, people struggle with here. First and foremost, us business owners, us entrepreneurs, solopreneurs, freelancers, whatever you want to call us, we're weird. Like we're strange people. We have issues to deal with. Yes. Um, <laughs> some, some of us more than others, but I mean, we do. We have some issues. And the biggest issue that we have is letting go. We have this preconceived misconception ingrained into our skull by society that the word success equals working your butt off until you land in hospital with a nervous breakdown or something is equally brutal right? A marriage dissolving or, you know, whatever, whatever the case may be. So it's, you know, we have, we, society has rammed that down our throats. Being a, you know, being a 16 hour a day, seven day a week entrepreneur doesn't make you a more successful entrepreneur. It just makes you a more tired, stressed out one in my eyes. Mm -hmm. And if, if you can let go and realize the talent that the global economy has created for us nowadays and build your team based upon this, this talent, no matter where it is on the planet, you are going to be way better off for it. But this is the big thing right here. A lot of people are going to say, well, you know, what's the point of teaching someone else how to do something if I can just do it myself in the same amount of time, if not faster and know that it's going to be perfectly fine. Like, I, I, I don't need to teach someone else. I can do it myself in, in the same amount of time. Now, that might be true. Uh, let's take the example of a blog post, right? Uh, let's say you write the blog post, and you should always write your content. The content should always come from you. you sh- that's one thing you should never outsource, right? So you create your content, uh, and it's in a Word document, and you slam it into WordPress, and then you spend the next 45 minutes tweaking it, dumping in images, embedding videos, maybe a podcast episode, maybe a graphic or two, um, bolding, italicing, URL links, uh, uh, you know, H2, H3, H4, subtitle tags, all the rest of it. You're going to spend 45 minutes at least tweaking that post, getting it ready to go live to the world. How about, now here's just an idea, how about the next time you do that, you hit record on ScreenFlow or Camtasia, or Jing, and you record yourself doing that, talking through why you do this in a specific way and why you like it to look this way. Then you hit record again, and you stop recording. And then you take that clip, and you put it into Dropbox, and you get a virtual assistant to watch it three or four times, and then start doing those things for you, so that you never have to do that thing again. Let's say if you blog three times a week, you're going to save yourself over two hours a week, eight hours a month. What would you do with eight hours extra extra every single month? I would strategize for growth. I would spend more time with my top 20% clients. I'd develop products, services. I'd go to more events. I'd travel. I would, uh, you know, uh, sit on webinars, uh, you know, just because I can, because I've got the time to be able to do it. You know, all these different things, way, way more high level stuff than laying out a blog post. Yeah. And you're just talking about one specific incident. Yeah. I mean, exactly. or, or task or, right. ta- you know, and, and, and I want to stress here that you're doing exactly what, uh, are you familiar with Jay Bear at all? Yes. I love Jay. He's Jay, a friend of mine. Yeah. Jay was on the show. Wow. It's been a while. But anyway, he said, you got to delegate away the stuff that you shouldn't be doing so that you can do the stuff that only you can do. And then I, and I, I, and like, I think what you're saying is, is that's the content. It's got to be you. It's got to be you doing that. 
It's got to be. And I mean, I, I, so I, I sometimes get my clients to go through a th- my three list of freedom exercise, and I right. talk about it in the books. Can I, can I share it real quick for your listeners? Sure, yeah. Okay, right, because this is a game changer. I did this myself at that resort in December 2009. I didn't call it the three list of freedom at the time. That was a sexy name I gave it later on. But I, I, I physically sat down and made these three lists, right? So the first list is a list of all the things that you feel – sorry, a list of all the things that you just hate doing. Like you procrastinate all day long and then you just rush them through the door just to get them out of the way. You, you hate these tasks. The second, we've all got those tasks, right? The second list is a list of all things that you can't do. Now, this is where your entrepreneurial mindset has to really be kept, kept in check because you think you can do everything. You are Superman. There's no kryptonite in your universe. Fact of the matter is you can do everything better than everyone else in the entire world. But in reality, that's not the case, right? It's not the case. Yeah, yeah. So you know when you struggle with something. So that's your second list, list of things that you can't do. And then the third list, and that brings up what Jay said, third list is a list of all the things that you feel as the business owner you shouldn't actually be doing, right? Now, this is, it's a hard list to put together. And I'll tell you why. We go back to the other two lists. Number one, you might actually like doing these tasks. Number two, you might actually do these tasks really, really well possibly just as well, if not better than other people out there. But the big question is, like I said, for the third list, should you actually be doing them as the business owner? And once you put those three lists together, you almost create a roadmap for yourself to be able to follow to go on this whole outsourcing virtual team building journey. And Jay has got it 100% bang on the money right. You should be spending the time doing the stuff that only you can do. And I'm telling you now, there's a lot more people out there that, other than you that can put together a blog post or filter email or update Facebook for a few examples. Man, those three lists are powerful. I'm going to have to do that. Oh, you've got to. I, I oh. urge every, every single person listening to this session right now must do that exercise at the absolute earliest opportunity. It will revolutionize your life, your business, your personal life, everything. It'll, it'll, it totally flipped the entire thing on its head for me. That's just – it's such a great filter to, to push your priorities through to really right. like – because we all, we, all we all have a million priorities that are you know, things that are really, really important above all the other stuff. But then when we have a huge list of all these different priorities – then how do you decide which of the priorities is a higher priority than the other priorities? <laughs> right, so exactly. this filter really exactly. helps with that. That's awesome. Yeah, it sure does. Glad you like it. I do. <laughs> <laughs> so then uh, how if, – if once you've gone through those lists, it's like, OK, now I know who I'm looking for. I know since there's – again, there's no super VA or super person to like delegate everything to that I don't want to do or or whatever that it you now can say, OK – who am I looking for to first alleviate some of the time or pressure or whatever from you know that the outcome of those lists? Yeah, I mean, nine times out of ten, the first hire, if you're looking at the team building side of things, right? Forget about the task and the project type of outsourcing, the team building side of outsourcing. The f- nine times for out a, of ten, for the a first, role. Yeah, for yeah, the role. Okay, yeah. got the it. first role. 90% of the time is going to be a general VA, a GVA. And a GVA, is, it really is your gal Friday sort of type of role. It's, uh, you know, these guys, for me, they are a godsend. They're, they're literally worth their weight in gold. Um, they are just unbelievably strong, uh, you know, multitasking type employees that can handle so many different tasks for you that that still end up being within one role and i mean i'll I'll, you know i'll give you a few ideas so filtering through your email right um here's here's a quick way of being able to manage your email very very effectively this is the way i do it with my va myself her name is marie i wake up early i uh have a cup of coffee and then i'll do some sort of exercise yoga swimming basketball whatever right and then i'll come back and i'll eat breakfast with my boy, and then I get to work at around 10 a.m. Marie starts her work day at 8 a.m. I get around 200 to 250 emails a day. By the time I switch on my laptop at 10 a.m., she has already blanked out like 
70% of those emails by either just spam blocking them, deleting them, archiving them, forward them on to other people to deal with, or actually replying with canned responses that we've already created in a document that's probably 20 pages long right now over the last few years. So people get the replies and, and the help and the solutions and the tools that they need. Um, but ultimately, I don't have to deal with 70% of it anymore. So I turn on my, I turn on my computer, I look at my, my email and say, oh, okay, Marie's already gone in and cleaned it out. I've only got 30, 40 emails to go through now. That's great. I can do that in an hour. And I, I have a three-click rule with email, which basically means that when I open an email, I'm going to either reply or forward it, I'm going to archive it, or I'm going to delete it. I never open up an email more than once. I mean, it, you got to really like ingrain this into your skull. It's very, very hard to do at first. But once you do that, you will find that you will go from two, three hours a day in your inbox to literally 30 to 40 minutes. And I love it. So that's just one thing that a GVA can help you with. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> um, a couple of the other things are things like, you know, scheduling Facebook posts, right? I hate Facebook. I'm not a big Facebook fan. I am there because my audience is there. I would rather be using Google+. Plus. I like the interface better. I think it looks cleaner. There's less in, uh, you know, distractions, et cetera, et cetera. But my audience is on Facebook, so I have to go where my audience is. So what I do is I get my VA every Friday, puts together a list of 20 status updates. I don't bother with touching it over the weekend, but 20 status updates that she will put together, everything from business quotes to links to old posts, links to other people's posts, videos, questions, funny little tidbits, you name it. 20 of them on a Friday afternoon, sends it over to me in a Word file. I go through it, make any little changes or tweaks, and dump it back in the Dropbox. She will then, on Friday afternoon, the last thing she does on Friday afternoon, is she will then go ahead and schedule all of those posts in Facebook, two a day, Monday through to Friday, for the next day, for the next week. Nice. That's another thing that I'm not doing. Yeah. That she's handling for me. Now I go on to Facebook and I'll interact. I'll answer questions and comments and likes and all that stuff. But I'm not the one physically posting 80% of what goes onto my Facebook page uh, for well over two years. I haven't touched it. Yeah. So I, I mean that right there is a massive because you go on the Facebook is like YouTube. You know, you go to watch uh, you know uh, uh, an acceptance speech on YouTube that you want to see, and before you know what's happening, you know. An hour and a half later, you're watching some guy doing Bobby De Niro impressions. You know what I mean? <laughs> so, well, it happens to me anyway. So, yeah. it's, you know, same, same thing with Facebook. You know, you go on there to look at a, 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 you know, a status update or a feed or whatever, and then before you know what's happening, you know, you're playing Farmville or something ridiculous. So, um, so you know, all this stuff: hotel, flight, accommodations, uh, managing a calendar, creating basic reports, um, managing a blog. Uh, managing a Twitter account for you, uh, replying to things, you know, setting up hashtags, uh, you know, Hootsuite, uh, answering support tickets for your website, um, you know, uploading your podcast episodes, uh, helping you put the show note links together, all that stuff. VAs can do all of that for you. And that particular, all those roles right there, all those tasks, a GVA role worth their weight in gold, literally. Yeah, yeah, because it frees you up. Man, absolutely, yeah, absolutely. I, I I presented at NMX a couple of years back on the subject of content marketing and how the large majority of content marketers have got it all wrong, where they're doing the content marketing when they should be focusing on just the content creation. And so what is I what I did is I put together forty five tasks that you can outsource to VAs to catapult your content marketing, and it was a it was a big successful hit that particular session and I, I added it all up at the end like you know I, I had this little stopwatch in the corner of every slide that I was showing them with each task um, you know five minutes here 10 minutes here 20 minutes here you know and we added it up by the end of uh, by the end of the 45 tasks if you had blogged three times a week or created three pieces of content every week every week for a month you're looking at around 90 hours of work right there, which is over half your normal work month. Mm -hmm. Just imagine if you could inject 90 extra hours into your month next month. What could you achieve? I mean, it would be like you'd, you'd literally be living in that movie Limitless. You'd be popping those right. pills. Yeah, you know what yeah. I mean? You'd just kill it. You'd, you'd get so much more done. 
And that is possible. And that's why I say if people say to you that you can't buy time, you can buy time. It's called delegation. It's called hiring and team building. It's not new. It's been going around for centuries. Yeah, that's there's so much more we could talk about on this. I love that. <laughs> I love that one, there's a book out there that's probably going to be the source for this that you wrote. And uh, it goes so much more into the training, how you train your team members and how you can go about delegating them and managing them and building that team. And it's just, mm -hmm. it's awesome to me to know that this is an option for people out there. And even if you're not, say, even if you're just a person who works in an office and you're not an entrepreneur, these, again, these principles that we're talking about are still 100% practically applicable to your your situation. You just have to take, again, that, that three lists, geez, that's just still mind-blowing to me. So. Uh, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's huge. Uh, it's, it's huge. I mean, you're absolutely right. You can put this into any work life type situation um you know there are some people that outsource um you know doing things like doing their shopping online you know here's my list i got three kids and a husband to feed i literally buy the same stuff every single week but it takes me an hour and a half each week to sit there online and do it and get the thing delivered can you do it for me yeah sure no problem yeah. you know, that's just one simple task <laughs> that a housewife could outsource you know yeah. you can't outsource parenting I, I would try that if I knew it would work, but I'm pretty sure it would fail horribly. Yeah, and and I think that's what you're talking about is there there are things that you should never outsource or never delegate away. But once you know those things, you, you just become so much more aware or mindful of that that then when you're doing those things, you enjoy them. Right, right. So. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Chris, it's been awesome to talk with you. Again, I want to mention the name of the book that comes out. When does it come out again? It's out April one. Okay, uh, and that's it's already available. No, it's it's not a, an <laughs> April. I keep, I you know, I keep, I I keep bashing my publishers' heads. I'm like, you know, is this like a joke? Like, is, <laughs> are you playing like, like, are we actually dumping the project? Like, you know, <laughs> what's going on here? You know, why April first? But who knows with these publishers? Who knows? Yeah. But yeah, it comes out April one, but it is available um, on Amazon for pre order if anybody wants to grab it. And uh, however. Before you do that, I suggest you visit virtualfreedombook.com because uh, there's tons more info on there and there's um, some really, really cool, very, very manageable bundle options and stuff like that. And I'm thinking solopreneur with this audience. Yeah. So you know, we're, we're giving stuff away just, in, just if you buy one book. So instead of just going to Amazon and doing that, hop over to the site and see what you can grab and then uh, you'll know exactly what the, uh, the whole deal is. Awesome. Virtual Freedom, Freedom. Book. Virtualfreedombook.com. Awesome. That's Chris, it. it's been great talking with you. Thank you so much for being on the show. No, thank you for asking me on. I'm a fan, and uh, you know, we finally got the opportunity to meet in Vegas, NMX, and uh, it was great. You know, it's funny. You, you meet people face-to-face -face for the first time. Uh, you've been you know, admirers of them for, for a while. You've conversed a little bit via Twitter or whatever, and then you just know when you meet them, you just know that you're going to be buddies with this guy for a long, long time. And that's exactly how I felt when I saw you in, in Vegas. Oh, Chris, thank you so much. <laughs> I, no, felt, I felt the same way. <laughs> you're, you're a warm and cuddly kind of guy. How oh. can you not fall in love with Eric? <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's end on that note. Yes, let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Thanks, Chris. All right, buddy. Well, I want to say thank you again to Chris Ducker for bringing the awesome for yet another great episode of Beyond the To-Do List. Make sure to go check out his book at virtualfreedombook.com. Thanks again to Reich for supporting Beyond the To-Do List and making this podcast possible. Make sure to check out the 30-day premium trial they are giving for free at reich.com slash to-do. That's w-r-i-k-e dot com slash to-do. If you've enjoyed this episode, please give us a rating or review on iTunes if you'd like, or just give me a shout out on Twitter at Eric with a K, the letter J, F I S H E R. I look forward to hearing from you, and I'll see you next episode.
Beyond the To-Do List is a proud member of the Noodle Mix Network. Find more of our award-winning and award-nominated podcasts to make you think, laugh, and succeed at noodle.mx. Learn how to podcast. Theorize over the TV shows Once Upon a Time, Once Upon a Time in Wonderland, and Under the Dome. Laugh with our clean comedy, delve into science fiction and philosophy, learn critical thinking from movie reviews, and more at noodle.mx.